Thank you, Andrew. That's great. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, everybody, uh, for coming along. Um, I've been working for Cults24 for about 20 years, and in all that time, I think my focus has been working with the smaller guys, smaller museums, to winkle out those stories and share them and find audiences for them. Um, Museum Crush is my day job. Um, that really does focus on collection-based stories, um, taking those stories, working collaboratively with curators, front of house, volunteers, whoever's actually got the story, and trying to develop that story together and think about the audience for those stories. Um, we also, and I'm also involved in a thing called learning modules where we bring museums together. And again, that's bringing smaller museums to explore the possibilities of digital storytelling. And I'm still amazed really that people don't fully exploit um, the power of collection stories to really connect with audiences. Um, and effectively use the collection to market the museum and to effectively sell the brand. Because I think smaller museums especially are under a lot of pressure. You know, their social media accounts are under a lot of pressure. You've got a lot of messaging to go out there. You've got a lot of stuff to sell. And there's also that pressure to do too much. I find that a lot of museums, a lot of smaller museums, They've, all, they've got steam coming out of their ears and it's very difficult to take your foot off the gas and to kind of work iteratively and experimentally. I find that hard to do as well, very hard. Another thing that we've introduced really recently in our work at Cults24 is this idea of the new voice and connecting with communities. And we're currently involved in a co cohort of museums who are exploring community connections um, and how you tell those stories with communities, sometimes hard to reach communities. And both of our speakers today have got some experience of that uh, in that area where they've tried experiments out, they've tried to do things, some things have worked more than others. And as, I, as we all know, it's very important to be able to fail in some instances, uh, certainly on Museum Crush, I fail regularly to hit the audience that I want to, but an important part of doing this kind of thing is the process, is to actually try these things. And as I said earlier, to be iterative. It's about the process, it's about, yes, it's about the funding you have sometimes to do things, but if you're doing a funded project, it's then taking that learning over into your everyday storytelling practice. Um, and it's also about experimenting. Um, and it's also about translating the marketing advice that you sometimes get from people, from experts, and relating it to your personal position in the small museum, which is not always easy to do, because you've all got your own situations, your own pressures, uh, your own peculiar ways of working perhaps with volunteers, you don't have a marketing manager, etc., etc. Which kind of brings me very nicely to our two guests today. Uh, Elizabeth Wolidge, director, curator, and many other things as well at the Royal Crown, <laughs> at the Royal Crown Derby Museum, who's done all kinds of nice little innovative things, and she's going to share some of those things with you in a sec. And also Rachel Midgley, who's a curator at the Gawthorpe Textiles Museum, or Gawth Gawthorpe Textiles Collection, I should say, uh, who's done lots of lovely things. Now, they're going to share some of the things they've done. They won't give you all the answers and how to do digital storytelling for a, a small museum, but hopefully they'll give you some, some ideas and a bit of inspiration. And then afterwards, we'll have a bit of a Q&A, hopefully, and take some, take some uh, questions from the floor. So. Um, Liz, over to you. Thank you very much. Lovely. 
Okay. So, thank you very much for coming, everybody. Lovely to see so many people here today. Um, so, uh, yes, I am the director of the Royal Crown Derby Museum. It's a very small museum. I'm the only paid member of staff. So, whilst on the positive side, I'm definitely on the senior management team. On the downside, I'm also the toilet cleaner and the pest control manager, which is really good fun. I get to hoover up the flies every morning. Um, so, I have jokingly said that my biggest target um, for the next year is that our visitors outnumber the flies in the museum. Museum. Um, so, um, uh, but uh, it's also been really good fun. I started the role two weeks before the first national lockdown, which you could consider was really bad timing, but also gave me quite a unique opportunity to explore some of the things which um, we might do in the future. So I decided that I would take the time to be experimental, to try different things, and to think, what can we do now that will give me an insight into what would be our vision for the future? It gave me that unique opportunity and space to just have a go at things with actually fairly low stakes during that time period. Um, I also decided to strategically uh, fundraise to try to fundraise for projects which would strongly reflect what we wanted to be our future vision and approach. So rather than to chase any kind of funding, but to be very self-selecting about what we target what we were going to target and how that was going to be um, a hint, if you like, of what we might be able to do in the future. Um, well, it's quite a long story as to why, but we weren't actually eligible for any of the standard COVID recovery funds or anything like that. I won't bore you with the reason why, but that was why we weren't chasing that kind of stuff. Um, one of the things I wanted to address um, was um, the, our um, exhibition. So if you were to walk through our museum door today, um, oh, that's just our happy, happy people. Um, no flies in that photograph. But if you were to walk through our museum doors today, this is what you would see. A sad, slightly empty, well, very empty museum, although I did hoover the flies up for that photograph. Um, and, um, but one of the problems that we had initially was that an exhibition which is in this space and a larger space had been uh, put in there by uh, our marketing team or Royal Crown Derby's marketing team. And that meant it only told one story. It told the story of please buy our plates. Please, please buy our plates. Um, but that might not have been the best story or the most interesting story for the museum to tell. Um, and Royal Crown Derby actually has a much richer place in today's cultural context than you might assume. I wanted to capture and record some of that for future visitors. And one of the projects that we fundraised for um, and were granted funding, thankfully, um, by Arts Council England was a project called Pattern of Life, a project which asked some of the passionate collectors of Royal Crown Derby uh, from the Gypsy, Romany and Traveller communities to tell us the stories behind their most treasured collections. In a way, that is using our collections as a catalyst for storytelling, but it's also about using our audience's collections as a catalyst for storytelling and exploring the way in which, in fact, the items which are held that were manufactured by us but held in the wider community almost become a creative extension of our own collections. Um, the project was to co-curate an archive of stories in partnership with um, Romany storyteller Richard O'Neill, who was an absolutely key partner in this project. And thanks to our funding, we collected some fantastic stories. This shows our... Um, uh, uh, our kind of opening event. So after we'd done our digital uh, storytelling and collecting, which we did working with Rural Media's Traveller's Times and uh, through Richard O'Neill's contacts and through every contact I could scare up by Googling uh, Romany Traveller community groups and just sending them emails and saying, hi, we're doing this thing, um, please contribute. Um, we were able to collect a number of stories, not as many as we'd wanted. I think we initially hoped to get 60 stories, but the reality was closer to uh, 20 or 30. Um, and uh, we collated our stories into a digital archive. Um, and uh, the project culminated with the installation of this large white box that you can just see between the people on the, I don't know which way around it is, is you're looking at it, the right hand side. Um, and it's a digital book really based on our artistic pattern books that visitors can stroll through and hear the stories that were submitted by the people who took part in it. 
as with any project where we genuinely aim to co-curate, I was really keen that participant stories were not over-edited. You're probably not sure if you can read the text. You might be able to read the text on there. This is an example of one of the stories. Um, I'm not going to read it out loud because that's really boring when people read aloud from the PowerPoint presentation. Um, but um, there were a huge range of stories. And in each case, I was really conscious that I was not going to re-edit. I wasn't going to rewrite them in my curatorial voice, but I wanted to let the voices of the participants shine through because there were many lovely, authentic voices there. And I was actually quite honored and quite moved by the end of the project by how much people trusted me with the stories. The one I've put up there is actually quite humorous, but some of them were very moving and deeply personal stories about family members and the inspiration that came from collecting and owning Royal Crown Derby China. Um, and um, it's interesting because um, what we wanted to do was to create a space where that history that was given to us by those participants sat beside that of royal commissions and that of items made for visiting dignitaries and wealthy international clients. Because the fact that the product is loved in the Romani traveller community is just as important as the fact that we have a relationship with Buckingham Palace. Um, and um, the people who came to our open day were actually very moved by the fact that their stories, this is me talking to Richard O'Neill there and looking at our installation, um, very moved that their stories would sit in our museum and were saying, oh, you know, it's wonderful that we can bring our families here. Our stories would be showcased here. We can bring our families, our children, and they would feel that we were an important past of that history. Now, the crushing downside of that is our museum remains almost totally closed. However, hopefully only for a, a short uh, time now. Um, and we were able to offer, through the Traveller's Times, uh, free vouchers for anybody who was a reader of Traveller's Times to come and have a private tour and explore the collections and that installation. Interestingly, though, those vouchers were never used. And that's an interesting reality check. That was a really nice idea of mine to offer this free access. But actually, even though we've published that twice in Traveller's Times, there's never been redeemed a single time. And the woman who was the chair of the Derby Gypsy Liaison Group um, said to me, don't be offended if you don't get this um, you know, easy relationship long term, because actually we are a very, very private peoples, and it is not easy to just blow away those boundaries. Um, but anyway, we keep, uh, we'll, we'll keep up the work. Um, we are currently uh, working on a similar project called Collecting Home, collecting stories from the local um, uh, British Caribbean community in Derby. Um, and these were two lovely ladies who visited the museum to tell me um, a story about the plate they're holding. Um, again, a fascinating story. You'll have to wait till the end of the project to find out what it is. That's just a teaser. Um, but also an insight not only into why people collect, what that means to them, but also the social and cultural history of what it meant to be a British Caribbean person living in Derby throughout the last 50 years. Um, so it's interesting that when we start talking about our objects, we actually unravel a whole wonderful raft of social history that comes with it. So um, if I had any advice for people running small museums, it would be have a go, just have a go. Here are some of the things that we've experimented with and some of the things that worked and some of the things that didn't. We talk a lot about museums enabling failure, but that's equally important whether it means your boss empowering you to experiment and not being mad when you learn things because they don't work rather than because they're a resounding success. If you're working for yourself, it also means giving yourself permission to experiment and to fail and to be nice to myself when I try things and they don't work. Because let's face it, quite often they don't. When I first set up our Facebook page, for instance, I tried doing a weekly something for children. It was just a silly joke about one of our lion figurines causing havoc in the museum and like eating the buffalo model and things like that. It was just, you know, nothing more than that. Didn't ever get a single click, like or engagement on it. Okay, what did I learn from that? Wrong audience, right? We don't have an audience that's that uh, in that market. What I did learn was that short videos worked best 
Um, I started off doing them on a daily basis during the week. That meant I had to think of 52 fresh ideas, a new theme every week throughout the year. I started to run out of ideas after 18 months, so I needed to rethink that. Again, I learned something. I learned that I didn't have a bottomless pit of creative ideas, that I had to think differently. Now I'm doing them as a monthly theme every other day. That's only 12 new ideas every year. That's much less difficult to facilitate. Um, other experiments have been an escape room experience based around the museum's collections. Um, that's not them trying to escape, that's them enjoying some interactives. That was a total failure, didn't get a single booking. Um, again, probably the wrong audience at the wrong time. Something that worked was um, doing a introducing interactivity into our factory tours. We got some actors to bring to life some stories from the past, to jump out on visitors and ask them to sign a petition against women workers, which happened uh, in, the, uh, in the 1800s, um, and then to explore the fact that we actually now employ quite a lot of women um, and make a, you know, something fun of that. That was quite successful. We sold tickets, we got really positive feedback on it. I learned something. People enjoy that kind of interactivity, but we probably don't have a young enough or funky enough audience for the escape room idea, even though our volunteers who tried it said they loved it. This picture shows a trial of our interactive factory tours. This is one of our volunteers, John, posing as a happy visitor very nicely for me. And um, he's experimenting with gilding or painting um, a plate. He's using red paint, which is how we train the apprentices. And this will be... Um, this will be the flavor of things to come, as we hope in the future to try and integrate our historical stories with our museum and uh, collections alongside the hands-on tactile approach of a factory tour, with opportunities for people to get involved, to get hands-on and work alongside our artisans whilst learning about our history. I'm really excited in the future to try to uh, integrate our exciting factory tour with our museum, without creating a split between this way for the fantastic, exciting, wonderful factory tour and this way for the museum. I don't want it to be a kind of apology. You know, what I want to do is integrate that and bring the excitement from the hands-on factory tour into the storytelling in the museum. And I think that some of the things I've done over the last two years with digital storytelling have helped me understand and learn how to do that. So my biggest tip is to have a go, because in having a go, you learn what works, you learn what doesn't, you forgive yourself for what goes wrong, and you take on and build with what goes right. So that's all I need to say to you. So over to you. Okay, hello everyone. Um, so my name's Rachel Midgley. I'm the curator at Gawthorpe Textiles Collection. Um, I'm aware that not a lot of people have actually heard of Gawthorpe Textiles Collection, so there's a bit of info on there for you to have a little read through. Um, but basically, we're a very, very small team. Uh, I think there's four members of staff, but we add up to one and a half people in terms of our hours. Um, and we're looking after a collection of about 30,000 items. We have no dedicated IT, social media, anything like that. So everything we do, we have to keep it really streamlined and very efficient and keep it to things that we ourselves know how to do. Um, and we don't really have any kind of chance to outsource that to anyone else. So that's just to give you a bit of context for as I'm going through the rest of the presentation. Um, and I'm going to talk you through a few different projects that we've um, actually worked on, uh, hopefully to give you a few ideas about things that you might be able to try yourselves. Um, and generally, we're kind of really embracing social media um, and all the kind of things that come with that. Um, so I'll talk you through some of the projects. So that first of all, we kind of start off with finding some stories that we want to tell, and that's a kind of common theme with all of the projects that I'll be talking about, where we, we kind of started off with objects in the collection um, and then thought about how we were going to kind of share those with people. Um, so this kind of became really important because we stayed open um, in terms of us going into work and working from home throughout the entire pandemic, but our museum itself was actually completely closed. So um, that's what really kind of pushed us into fully embracing the sort of digital storytelling um, and, and actually kind of trying to find some solutions to mimic what we used to do with the public in person. So um, we were used to running lots of in-person workshops and study visits and we were trying to find a way of capturing that in a sort of digital format uh, with the types of stories and objects that we were then sharing digitally. 
So we were kind of very lucky that we'd actually just finished working on a project recently uh, before the first lockdown um, where we were given a lot of funding from the Esme Fairburn Collections Fund and that had really helped us to sort of piece together some provenance and some donor information that we could link back together with items in the collection. Um, and that was really good because it gave us a starting point of a sort of pool of items that we'd already done some good work on and that we could start sharing. And then from when we kind of worked through those, then that's when we had to move on to finding these new stories and uh, sort of selecting new areas of the collection to work with as well. So the first one that I'll talk about is one that we did that was quite um, a sort of insular one. And then so the sort of organization of it and the research and things were all kind of done kind of in-house. And um, there was kind of some input from the community, um, but only in the sort of object selections. And that was the 60 Objects, um, Collection in 60 Objects uh, project. And that was to celebrate 60 years since the founding of the Charitable Trust, which manages our collection. Um, so we, we picked 60 objects, uh, which sounds like it's not very many, but it was actually really, really hard to whittle down the collection of 30,000 objects into 60 to be kind of fully representative of the collection. Um, we were really wanting to focus on the variety of items that there are in the collection and the breadth of the collection, and also appeal to different types of audiences with the types of objects that we were selecting as well. So some of that was to do with the actual type of object, but it was also about the story that we were going to tell about that object. Object. So when we were selecting the objects, um, we actually invited submissions from quite a, a big pool of people. So there was all of the staff could put in their kind of favorite pieces. Um, we also selected some that were um, suggestions from our team of volunteers and our team um, of kind of people that we've collaborated with recently. So things like university tutors, um, artists and practitioners that we've done kind of commissions from. And then also um, kind of members of the public and our friends of Gawthorpe Society as well. So we were trying to kind of just see if we could get these people to suggest things. And it, it worked really well in that we got this very eclectic set of items. But one downside was there were certain items that I think everyone, <laughs> almost everyone suggested, which was great because we knew they had to be included. But if that was the only thing somebody had suggested, suggested and somebody had already put it forward, it was kind of like, oh, you know, well, we've already got that one, but what else would you like to see? So that was one of the sort of downsides just in the selection process. But when we finally kind of, you know, reduced that down to what we actually wanted to use, um, we set about filling in any gaps of research where we thought maybe we could benefit from a little bit of extra information about something. And then also making sure that we had really, really good quality images of everything as well. So some things we'd had professionally photographed in the past and some we had to do in-house photography for. So once we knew about the items we had and we had all the material around them, we uploaded them onto our online gallery, which is um, a very, very simplistic uh, blog format, which is just hosted on Tumblr. It's kind of a leftover from an old website that we used to have and um, that we've kind of now updated our main website, but the gallery is still hosted um, on Tumblr because it was very easy to just post images on there. Uh, and the format worked really well for us uh, in terms of just the layout and things like that. So. That's where we uploaded the um, objects and we gave them a dedicated tag within that so that people could click on that and it would link to the objects as a set rather than them being kind of lost in the other items that we'd uploaded to the gallery previously. So this is a screenshot that you can kind of see um, what the kind of it, the page looks like when you first look at that set of objects. And then each of these thumbnails can be clicked through um, to go to a page that's dedicated to that, that particular object. So this is one of the pages that um, we have for this sort of set of objects, um, which were a set of um, wool samples printed with these really amazing patterns in aniline dyes. So the reason these items were put forward was um, kind of twofold. It was to do with the actual technique that was used on them because they really encapsulated sort of technolo technological advances in the mid 19th century in dyeing, but they're also from a really, really local source to our museum. So they, these were made about five miles away in a village called Sabden. So uh, some people had put them forward because of the technique and some people had put them forward because of the kind of local provenance. So that was nice to be able to kind of do two for one with this item. Um, but you can see here we've got some uh, images that you can click on to zoom in and then also a nice bit of text kind of explaining the significance of that piece. And we did that for each of the items. So it just kind of put them into a bit of context for people. So the next project that I'm going to talk about is um, probably the the sort of most important one that we've worked on recently in terms of it linking to this theme. 
Um, this was called Patterns of Migration, and it was a, a really big collaboration between ourselves and also two departments at the University of Central Lancashire, which I'll call UCLAN from now on because it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, and it was funded in part by the Being Human Festival that was organized by the university, um, which kind of explored this theme of migration of people and movement of people, but then how that kind of impacts on um, sort of themes of multiculturalism and sort of sharing of ideas, sharing of sort of hum humanity. Um, and our sort of section of that was particularly focused on the idea of textile being a catalyst for people to start talking about shared identities, shared histories, or actually exploring the differences between different groups of people. So we worked with a really wide range of community groups, and um, it included some refugee and asylum seeker groups, and then also kind of local textile interest groups as well. So we were trying to mix people together. And um, it was a really successful project, but it did get slightly impacted by the, the lockdowns that we had to have, which meant that we had to really focus on the digital element more than I think we'd originally planned. So the way that we did that was by collecting stories and uh, actually publishing them online through an Instagram account. So we, we chose Instagram because it was a very visual and it also was a very easy thing for us to be able to use. Um, so it kind of cut down the time rather than us having to build a dedicated website. So these are just some of the stories that we, we picked. So I've got two stories. Um, you can kind of read through them on the screen. But this was a really nice one where a lady had shared um, quite a few different family photographs where she was looking at the fashions in there. And um, she basically was talking um, about the prints and things that she saw on her mother's dresses. And this sparked quite a lot of debate and discussion about the idea of cultural appropriation and using patterns that were quite, in, quite heavily inspired from the Middle East and, and India and how the sort of Western fashions have adapted those over the years. So it's a really interesting kind of start of a conversation, this piece. And then similarly, we've got this piece here, which was a kind of another variation of that same theme about kind of cultural appropriation, which um, was a, a lady who shared a traditional Vietnamese ao dai that she'd been given by one of her Vietnamese friends. And she talked about this. Um, this is a section from a much longer story, by the way. And she, she talked in a bit of detail about the idea that she was quite worried about wearing the item in case she offended anyone. And her friends sort of reassured her that they would not be offended and they would be so sort of happy to see her. So um, there were some really, really interesting stories got brought up in this, and um, it was really nice. There's lots of them on there. If you want to um, have a sort of browse through and see the type of stories that we, we found, um, they're all on that Instagram. And um, yeah, I think that was probably a really, a really good outcome for uh, the, the whole project, um, given that we, we had originally planned something different and it was impacted quite heavily by the pandemic. So um, the last little bit is about some Pinterest boards that we tried out. So these were a thing that we worked on with Culture24. And we tried out this idea of using Pinterest boards to share specific sets of items with, the, with a kind of different audience, uh, maybe that wouldn't necessarily come to our um, venue in person or wouldn't come to the website. Um, and that was kind of just to try and deal with maybe a younger audience and students as well. So we talked a lot with some um, local university tutors about what they thought the students would like to see. We found it really difficult to actually get information from the students themselves about what they wanted from the sort of boards we were creating. Um, it was relatively easy to get them to say whether they liked or didn't like something, but then saying why they didn't like it was quite tricky. So um, that was kind of a, a bit of a um, stumbling block for us, but it was good, I think, feedback from the uh, tutors themselves, which has kind of given us this inspiration to um, carry on creating these Pinterest boards, but do them in a more targeted way so they're centered around specific modules on their courses so that they're kind of a learning resource for the university as well. So that's what we hope to kind of go forward with. Um, so there's a few things to consider that I just thought I'd mention just based on what we've, um, what we've been kind of working on. Um, we realized quite early on that we were very, very reliant on the level of photography that we had, which isn't great. Um, and we have a huge, a huge amount of the collection still to digitize. So that put a lot of pressure on us to make time to actually do that photography ourselves. Um, and that's definitely something to bear in mind if you're using quite visual ways of sharing things digitally like social media. Um, also, one issue with social media that we found was that people don't always want their stories to be told on social media. So we had to be really clear with people at the very beginning of their participation about how we were going to use things um, so that we could get proper kind of consent off them for, for using things like images and stories that, that they were sharing. 
Uh, and lastly, um, the sort of risk of the images actually being copied. This is something that we hadn't necessarily anticipated being too much of a problem, but um, as we do sometimes license images to uh, commercial companies, that kind of got raised that some of the things we've licensed, uh, we might want to then share. And if we put a really high resolution image of them online, somebody can just kind of rip that off and do their own thing with it. And it kind of negates the, the exclusivity of a, a license agreement that we have. So that was a kind of a bit of an issue that um, we're having to kind of just revisit on a case by case basis, I think. So last, last of all, um, this is just a very quick um, kind of intro to a project that we've just in the process of doing. We've got some funding from the um, National Lottery Heritage Fund to work on a big digital site which is going to share information and objects and images and other media as well um, about different objects from different collections across all of Lancashire. So it won't just be our collection. Um, but this, I just kind of included this because this has really come about because of all the projects that we've been doing over the last couple of years that I've just spoken about. Um, and it, they were really instrumental in us being able to write a really good bid for this, which led to us successfully getting the funding. So I think that's, it's kind of really nice, a little bit of hope <laughs> for everyone, hopefully, that if you do try out these projects, like Liz was saying, even if you don't necessarily succeed exactly as you want, to, they, they're really useful for learning and kind of informing other bids that you might write further down the line. So, yeah, I think that's the end. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your openness um, in those reflections, all of you. Right, we've got time for questions. So, if anyone's got any questions for any of them or all of them, can you? I'll come to you with the mic because we need to pick them up on the mic. Who's going to get the ball rolling? Hello. So uh, being small museums, uh, time and money are obviously very precious. What would you say is the most effective tools that you have that really help drive engagement? Hmm. Um, I think probably using social media, we found that really useful once we got our heads around how to effectively use it. Um, and we're still learning that definitely. Um, that's a really good way of just kind of not having to set everything up from scratch. You can just use a, a sort of format and a sort of functionality of the social media to kind of get you a bit of a jump start on actually sharing those stories. Um, and that's something, but it, we've had to kind of bear in mind, you know, working with different social media, it's not always the same content that can be shared on everything. So um, yeah, that has been really useful, I think, for helping us just quickly and effectively share things. I think I would say in answer to that, rather than, because that, I agree with that, but to add my idea would be, in a way, your most effective tool is other people. If you're a small museum, that might not be your team, but it might be partnership working. It might be looking for who has connections, uh, that we don't have, that I can just borrow through a yeah. partnership, who yeah. can reach an audience that I can't on my own through a partnership, um, and who has a tool for reaching another audience that I don't have on my own that I can steal through a partnership. So, steal other people's skills. <laughs> can I just add to that? It's interesting, in Gawthorpe actually used Pinterest there as well, which is a kind of forgotten social media platform. But it's interesting there that they used it for its functionality, a place where you could cur curate objects and do the job that they needed to do at, the, at that particular point. But Pinterest is it's not fashionable anymore, but it did a job for you there, didn't it? Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> right, we've got a question down here. Thanks. Hi. Um, with the social media, are you um, recording the insights or um, the audiences that you're reaching and do you find that you've been reaching different audiences through using the social media platforms than that you would have without using it? Uh, yeah, yeah, we, one, one of the big problems that we have is because we're based at a National Trust property, that creates a bit of a barrier with certain audiences because they would never think to come to a National Trust property for myriad of reasons um, and using social media I think it makes it much more accessible for different types of people and certainly when we we started using Pinterest and we were looking through the analytics on there we were very shocked to see how many people internationally were accessing our content that we hadn't really realized at all so I wouldn't say that we probably that effectively monitor them and really target things to kind of 
based on those insights, but it's useful for us just to kind of see that people are accessing the content and are using it from a variety of different sources. I would kind of say, in our case, a bit of yes and a bit of no, in that um, when we did social media posts about or targeted to specific groups of people who we were trying to reach, that particular post would get a spike in engagement, but it didn't translate much into engagement with our broader output. So whilst we might have been able to reach people very specifically, it didn't have that bigger impact on our wider audience. Although I would totally agree with what you said about an international audience. We do have an international audience through our social media, which we don't have, obviously, face to face. Yeah. yeah. Did you want to add anything there, Rich? Yeah, sure. Um, I think it's very important to be audience focused, obviously. And in a lot of the um, training we do, we we often say trot out that old chestnut audience first. But it is, it is important to understand your audiences and where those audiences are. And a lot, of, a lot of museums I work with, it's still Facebook because that's where your local audience is. Um, and the other thing that's interesting about it is, is this, this idea of the measure of success. You know, often people are still trying to chase the big numbers where if you, if you launch a project and your local audience is the audience that you're interested in, I would argue that two, you know, having a meaningful conversation with two people locally who then perhaps walk through the door is a very, very good measure of the success of that project. So, you know, for smaller museums, and certainly this is something we do on Museum Crush, is to move away from those kind of large audience figures and just be a bit more meaningful about how you are creating connections with the communities that you're trying to connect with. And that kind of relates to the kind of audience metric um, thing when, when looking at social media platforms. Yeah, and just, I would add as well that, that one of the really useful things you can do as a small museum is to talk to other people in other similar small museums to get a feel for what their numbers are like. Because as Richard said, we work with people and there's this expectation that you're using social media and so are billions of people, so you're going to have huge numbers. But yeah. get an idea of what people in your local places, you know, doing similar things to you or at a similar scale to you. And most of the time you'll get a really pleasant surprise, I promise, in, in when you benchmark yourselves against other people. It's a really useful thing to do. Right, any other questions? Yes. Hello, I wanted to go back to Pinterest, sorry, and ask, are you, were, were people clicking through to the website or were they staying on Pinterest and, and how, well, how did it work? Well, what, one of the issues, that one of the really big issues that we realized uh, as soon as we started using Pinterest with our boards was that um, we hadn't realized how many people had already pinned content from our other websites to Pinterest. Um, so it was very difficult to sort of see when things were coming through to the website, were they coming from somebody else's pinned content or from the stuff that we'd uploaded? Um, and we, we still kind of have the two in competition with each other. And it's kind of not really a competition because it's great if anyone clicks through. Um, so we, people were clicking through, but it actually wasn't always from the content that we'd put. Even if they were images of the same item, it was kind of coming from different sources. So, yeah. Thank you. One last quick question, if anyone, Stephen. Hello. Hi, uh, just a question about how you found um, uh, your groups um, and whether social media allowed you to be a little bit more um, national, international, as you might be able to contact them, not necessarily face to face. Yeah, I think um, when, when we kind of went into lockdown, we, we were really concerned that people weren't going to be able to come in person and we hadn't realized how big the international kind of demand and audience was for the content that we were putting out. So that was really nice to discover and it has meant through various things that we've done, I think because we've been publishing them on social media and doing lots of online events and things, we've been able to kind of build a bit of a relationship with that international audience and we've seen people from, um, you know, all over the world kind of regularly booking onto online events that we do now that were just people we weren't reaching at all before mm -hmm. so that's been really amazing I think so 
Yeah, I think that the kind of relationship building, like you're saying, I mean, and you were saying, you know, actually having a conversation with one or two people might really be considered a, a high success measure. You know, and I found that with our international audience quite a lot, that actually just being able to have a conversation with people, and actually some of those people then phoned me up, even though I'd just been commenting on, you know, their comment on our Facebook page. And I like, had a little chat with them and they were like, you've made my day, you've made me so happy. You know, and actually that was quite a nice thing to be able to do for people, isn't it? You know, and actually, especially during lockdown when people were quite isolated and quite lonely, they felt like they'd made a very personal connection with the museum, that they were able to, you know, engage with us on social media yeah. and then there was a real person there who they could engage with as well. Yeah, it's actually one thing I, I could add is really one thing that's been very useful for us is um, we have a lot of international textiles in our collection that we don't feel like we know enough about them but none of our staff are kind of expert enough to start you know just identifying things really kind of off the top of their head and when we started sharing content like that we actually started getting people that were from different parts of the world who knew a lot more about those textiles than we did getting in touch with us not in a you've made a mistake and I want to correct it but actually just offering help to help you know catalog things with us um, and also people that were just willing to go and do research in archives they had access to that we you know, we wouldn't be able to access or we wouldn't, it, they were in a different language, so we wouldn't be able to sort of translate them. And that was, that was really valuable for us to have, um, kind of build that network of kind of experts as well as just kind of happy members of the public as well, so. That's, that's so good to hear. We're going to end on that really positive note about those conversations. Um, if you haven't yet um, told your museums um, or heritage site stories on Museum Crush, you can find Richard on the Culture 24 stand over with the other museum support um, agencies in the corner over there. He'll be there all afternoon, go and say hello. Richard, I'm going to give you another job, I'm afraid, as well, which is to, can, can I, on your Culture 24 editor Twitter account, could you tweet some of the links that Liz and Rachel have talked about this afternoon? So if you follow Richard, you'll see those. Um, at 2.15, we've got um, a team from British Library's digitization team they're going to come and talk about things you need to consider before you digitize so do go and have a look come and see us again at 2 15 and thank you very much you three that was brilliant i, don't know. I just feel, i just know the computer will work <laughs>